<laughs> Hi everybody and welcome to our second live Google Hangout. We're doing things a little bit differently. Jill and I like to try new things. <laughs> and uh, just a reminder, some housekeeping to start with is just make sure that you've got uh, any programs running in the back like uh, Skype or Outlook or um, Internet Explorer. Um, not this channel. <laughs> if you've got them running in the background, shut them down because that will actually make the live stream experience easier for you and easier for you to see what we're doing and to hear us. So I'll hand it over to you now, Jill. We're live streaming from the blog pod at the Innovation Centre at the University of the Sunshine Coast as guests of Ben Amos. So thank you, Ben, for hosting us here. Um, we're, we're excited to spend this hour with you to talk about the buy, buy, buy messages that we're all on the receiving end of all of the time, but how they are ramped up, particularly around sale time. Mm. And here in Australia, we're in mid-season sales in spring. In the northern hemisphere, I guess that you'd be coming into full sales and the increase in merchandising, merchandising the marketing messages that we are bombarded with. And what we wanted to explore was how you can keep your sanity and your budget when you're on the constant receiving end of these kinds of messages. So we're going to ask each other a few questions. We're going to respond to your questions when you um, send them into us. So um, uh, start start with any of the questions that you have now, and we'll get to as many as we but can. Um, I'm going to okay. share a little bit with you about Michelle House who's a personal finance expert. Michelle is a mother of three. She's the creator of the Personal Budget Organiser and the 28-Day Budget Blitz program, which is very successful. Um, Michelle has worked in small businesses and uh, in large businesses in, in the corporate world and has also appeared in the media a great deal uh, on shows in Australia such as The Current Affair, Today, Tonight, Sunrise, uh, Nine News and The Morning Shows. So she is a much respected uh, commentator and expert on living many times. So, uh, and so I'm going to give you to, to Jill, who I completely admire every time I say this. Maybe <laughs> Jill shopped her wardrobe for 365 days and has a wonderful website called shopyourwardrobe.com. And Jill is all about conscious shopping and being conscious about what it is we are doing with our dollar. And you have a corporate background as well and a small business background, and you coach business uh, entrepreneurial women. And uh, you are also quoted in uh, the Wall Street Journal <laughs> and the San Francisco Chronicle and also has been seen in the media throughout Australia on programs like Today Tonight and Sunrise and Channel 9 and, and, and. <laughs> and we're really excited to be able to share with you our knowledge about this crazy time that we're just about to come into leading into the Christmas period. Yeah. Ooh, hold on to your hats. Yeah. <laughs> And I think also one of the things about that being bombarded with messages is you actually don't notice it. Yeah. Well, that's how they're designed. And one of the ways that marketers and merchandisers get us to part with our cash is because they're very smart. There is um, thousands upon thousands of people who are paid large sums of money to find new ways to get us to um, stop, stop thinking consciously, stop thinking mm. rationally and get us sucked into the buying cycle. That was said so well because that is what they're paid to do. They don't want us to be conscious. No. So they pay big bucks to keep us as unconscious as possible. Yeah. So we're here to make you up. <laughs> yeah, to wake you up and, and to have you think about the marketing messages you want to tune into and those that you deliberately want to tune out. And that is a very legitimate choice to say mm. no to some of the messages that, that you are receiving. Um, and you know, the minute you step into a shopping environment, uh, bricks and mortar or in line, you are on a conveyor belt. You are being um, bombarded with very deliberate messages that are designed to have you buy today in that buying experience. Yeah, yeah. So that's how they are manipulating us into buying more. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The whole experience, and, and I'll talk specifically about uh, bricks and mortar stores uh, because we all have experience with those, but the experience of bricks and mortar store is, is just replicated online using technology, but the experience is the same. You know, the whole idea is to have us uh, forget our real lives and forget our real financial situation and forget our real needs, what we do need what we will use, what, what we have a legitimate need for. 
and to fill our trolleys and baskets with more and more things. And certainly shopping centres have a very deliberate design um, that encourage us to do that. But signage is one of the most obvious things and um, signage changes an awful lot. So gone are the days of you know, Main Street shopping where there'd be some innocuous uh, you know, window display um, that was gentle and, and you were the active participant. Mm. You had to go to the store to engage in that buying experience. Now the buying experience leaps out of the store and comes to you. Um, and one of the things I find the most obnoxious in shopping centres are the hubs that are in, in the middle of the walkways. Um, and those salespeople are trained to go out and get you. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I find that invasive mm. uh, personally. If oh, I want to yes. engage in some kind of buying experience with, with that uh, organisation, mm. I want to have the choice to go to them. I don't want them to leap out and grab me by the wrist. It's almost like being door knocked as you're walking. Yeah. You know, that old door knocking sales people, isn't yeah. it? It's invasive. And a lot of signage is designed to certainly be attention grabbing and in some respects it's invasive in its mm. own way uh, in that it screams at you, it becomes something that's almost impossible to ignore. And if, if you're in a shopping environment and it's store after store, your senses start to become overloaded and that's deliberate. The, the whole idea is that it's a hypnotic experience of some sort uh, that's designed to, to lower your level of awareness. And of course, your awareness comes crashing in either when you get home and you look at your stash and you you go, why did I buy all this stuff? I don't need it. Or perhaps even um, more tragically, when you get your credit card statement or your bank statement and you realise how much you've spent, because by then the, the high of the buy has reduced. So so whatever high came has has come down. So the emotional impact of that purchase is at a very low point, and that that can coincide with this enormous amount of stress mm -hmm. you like how much you've spent. Yes, yes, and the amount of people that I have worked with that it's not until they get their credit card statement and they realise what they've spent their money on. And it's, you know, they're looking at that statement and thinking, oh, oh gee, oh, did I spend that much money this month? I must have. Yeah. And then continue again for the next month and get that high yeah. and then back down to the low and it's just this high low cycle. Yeah. And all shoppers um, go through that, that kind of cycle. Uh, those of us who have been over shopping, that cycle is just more pronounced. Mm. So the high is higher and the low is, is lower. Mm. But it's like basically follows the same pattern. Yeah. Mm. What, are, what are some of the tricks that, yeah, what are some of the insider tricks that they're playing on us that we can be a bit more mindful of over the next few weeks? <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot. Um, and if you read anything uh, about neuromarketing, which is a relatively new field, and neuromarketing is all about um, going around the conscious brain and going straight for our unconscious and having us purchase from, from that place. And there's a whole range of interesting reading by um, uh, Seligman, uh, I might have got the same one. Anyway, but from biology and brand wash, just written an enormous amount about this. One of the things is uh, about how merchandise is displayed and having merchandise displayed in a bin or a big basket in the middle of the store is one way of sending um, an unconscious message that those items are discounted. And they may in fact not be discounted and in fact if you were to have a, a closer look you could see that there is no sign that says these items are on sale or 50% off. It's just the fact that they are presented in a bin or a basket in the middle of the store. And uh, we were chatting before about uh, a local retailer who um, uh, I shared this strategy with them and they did exactly that. They, they got a big basket and they put things in it and they were amazed at how quickly things moved that had previously been placed elsewhere in the store. Nothing changed, Nothing not, changed. Not, a, not a single decimal point or number changed on the past case. They were just placed in a bin in a jumbly kind of way. It makes you feel like you're rummaging for a bargain. Yes. Like treasure hunting kind of. So beware of the basket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing is, depending on what those goods are, um, they may actually be poor quality by the mm. time you, you know, everybody's rummaged. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you pull them out of the bottom of the basket. They should be going to a rummage bin. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's one of the things uh, to be aware of. Another thing is um, the colour that um, signs 
are um, describing has a big impact on the psyche and, and red is the most popular um, colour. It's a very evocative colour, it affects our emotional um, system. It's one of the reasons why it's used so much in fast food um, logos and brands mm. and uh, it's very attention grabbing, it signals all kinds of different things from excitement to danger and just having a sign pictured in red can indicate that an item's on sale. Even if the word sale is not written there, it's the fact that it's on a red, red. price tag, on a red sign. Um, so that's just something else to be aware of. You may in fact not be buying anything that's on sale at all. That is just so true. Oh my gosh, I've just had a flash of all the red stickers that I've seen and I know there's a toy shop that their tickets that are stuck on there are all in red. Yeah. Nothing's on special. Yeah. Yeah. But I always think that it is because it's a red sticker. Yeah. And there's just something about the colour red. It makes us think that something's on sale. Uh, and, and here in Australia, one of our big retailers, David Jones, has a logo that's black and white. Uh, it's a checkerboard kind of pattern. And they will change that to red and white during sale time um, to, to great effect. Mm. So the colour red um, is used to great effect. Um, to have us think something's on sale. Wow. Okay. So, are there any? Is what are they? What are these marketing? What are these department stores and marketing people doing now to build up this hype as we go into Christmas? Because I know for me personally, I can. I'm feeling it. I can. Yeah. You know, the countdown's on. It's 12 yeah. weeks to go. You know, I saw the little Christmas outfits for the kids two weeks ago. So, what other things are, do we need to be mindful of? Well, one of the things we were talking about is what you've been on the receiving end with regard to Maya, another big Australian department store, um, which you're getting sales messages on multiple platforms in multiple ways. Everything from a paper flyer in your inbox, the one that's at the end of your driveway, the physical mm -hmm. inbox, to, to text messages. Yeah. And you're also getting emails. Yes. And so you're receiving all of these kinds of messages, building the hype. But also when you go in store, into a department store, it's almost like pencil and gretel and the breadcrumbs that are leading you to the store with all of the in, in um, centre signage that's there to grab your attention and lead you mm. to that particular um, store. And it's there to build a sense of anticipation that something big is about to happen. And of course, one of the industries that does this to great effect is the movie industry and they do this by promoting movies that are sometimes six months out and it creates that sense of hype where you, where you almost put it in your diary. You know, mm. like October 26 is when whatever is up mm. and, and um, marketers and retailers use exactly that same strategy, that sense of anticipation and, and layering the emotion. Yeah, and I noticed that the um, big department stores actually have their signage you can see it as you're approaching the store, but if you think about it, it's actually grabbed you outside the store yeah. before you even have gone in. So I've been bombarded at the mailbox, bombarded at the computer, bombarded on the phone. It, and on television. Yeah, and on, and on television and in the uh, with the weekend paper because they've usually got a nice big red, nice big red ad with all the red and white writing. Yeah, so I know that that's the place that I'm going to go and get the best deal. Yeah. But am I? <laughs> well, you, you know, that's the thing. And, and, and shopping centres, which is another thing we're going to talk about, are specifically designed um, to get you in and keep you there. Because the longer you're there, it's proven by research, the more you will spend. The longer time you spend in a shopping environment, the more you will spend. Um, and shopping centres are designed that way. And Victor Bruin was the person who discovered this. He was a contemporary of adult people. Um, and a, a graduate of the Vienna School of Design. And he was the first person who started to look at how shopping centres are designed. And, and he was the person who created the space between the street and the store, the vestibules. And if you, you ever go to an American department store, you see these beautiful vestibules. You can park a horse and carriage in them, they're huge. Um, and, and that was the very first contribution that Victor Bruin made to the design of shopping centres because he recognised that people were intimidated. They didn't want to go into the department store, which had this luxurious feeling. And, and at that time, of course, sales people were behind um, the counter and the goods were behind the counter. And you as the consumer couldn't access them directly. 
and Victory Grill then went on to design shopping centres that have us lose track of time and lose sense of direction. And mm. in that, they, they share some common characteristics with the casinos. Uh, with oh, that, yes. Where there are no clocks, uh, where the temperature is regulated. Uh, and where your sense of time and orientation is oh. completely disrupted. Uh, and, and if you've ever left a shopping centre and gone, I just spent four and a half hours <laughs> on my life. <laughs> and I, I honestly went for 10 minutes. Yes. Oh, my goodness. And I can think of a refurbished store in Brisbane, big, massive mall, that has done just that. And the actual feel of it, now that you mention it, is that dark, cosy feeling. Mm. Like a casino, yeah, where you could easily lose track of time. I mean, there's plenty of people sitting on the beautiful leather lounges. Yes. <laughs> well, if you're not sure this is true, here's my challenge. Go to a big department store, and, and I have travelled and shopped all around the world, <laughs> so I can say this with some certainty that this applies all around the world. Find a clock. Find a clock <gasps> in a public place in one of those shopping centres. And if you find a clock, take a photo, and send it to me or put it on my Facebook wall, I would be very interested to see who can find a clock in a shopping centre. And I'm not saying you can't, but I'm saying you're going to have to look for it. Yes, you certainly are. That is a challenge. <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to win. <laughs> and the jewellery store doesn't count, right? No, the jewellery store doesn't count. No, or the clock store. That doesn't count either. <laughs> So with all of that um, pressure, there's also pressure. Um, not only have we got the pressure from the influence of the stores, we've got our own pressures with our own personal finance and our own budgets and our own constraints with that. Then we've got the added pressures of family and what, we're, what we are buying, how much are we spending, what are we doing. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it is a pressure pressureful. Yeah, pressureful. <laughs> <laughs> it is a pressureful time. Yeah. So, um, do you have any other? What would be your number one tip for people that are entering a store and or before entering a store? Yeah, it all happens beforehand. If you haven't prepared before you've gone into a shopping centre, you're already behind <laughs> the eight ball. You are already ready to be on budget. <laughs> well, you're you're a sitting duck. Um, and I tell you, the, these retailers, marketers and merchandisers, they are serious. For a lot of them, the key time that they make money is in particular blocks and they are there to have a buy today in that. And so you need to be prepared before you enter the store. And so it all starts beforehand. And beforehand you really do need to know what it is that you need, know what it is that you will use. And this applies to, to everything that you're looking at buying. When I work with women on clothing shopping, which of course has a very close relationship to our identity and has a there's a particular um, sort of buying behaviours that happen around uh, clothing. Um, I, we talk about legitimate wardrobe gaps. What is it that you actually need? And if you don't know mm. what's already contained in your wardrobe, you can't possibly know what you need to fill those gaps. And if that's the case when you're still going shopping for clothes, it's for something other than a legitimate need. But that same thinking and process applies to any part Does. of your life. I, I mean, I know when I was in my unconscious shopping day, I would come home with two new sets of towels and wonder why I bought them. I already, when I came home, I've had like eight sets of towels. So like me and my husband, this was, you know, I mean, we could have, you know, dried off the Australian Olympic swimming team <laughs> with the amount of towels that we had because I had done an audit of what I already have, mm. and it's not just what you already have, what you like, but what you will legitimately need, what you will use. Mm. Uh, because to me, there's this few things sadder that people filling up their homes, and as a consequence, their lives with stuff they don't need and they don't use. Mm. You know, on uh, the last week. I went through and did a whole audit of our house. I actually found in the shed a, a big plastic box of presents for my 14 nieces and nephews that no longer apply because they found both of <laughs> That was just that I was buying as I went in. Oh, they'll want that for a birthday. Oh, somebody will want that for that. Yeah. Rather than go, going with a plan, this is what my plan is. Yeah. And this is how I can stay within my money. 
Yeah. yeah, so you want to have a plan. You want to have a list, and you want to be really clear about what that list is. And you want to also have a plan for how you're going to manage yourself when you're in that shopping environment. And, and I would say any time from the beginning of November onwards, but even starting now on the 1st of October, the messages we're getting about Christmas spending and holiday spending, um, they are starting to ramp up. Mm. And so you, I would suggest you need to start raising your awareness now, yes. when you go into a shopping environment. Would you actually agree that this year the ramping up is intensified? And do you think that's because we've had such a slow retail economy that this year we've had a change of government, everybody's feeling a little bit more positive, mm -hmm. that they're just going bang and, and are going to inundate us? Should we be prepared for that? Look, that could very well be the case. Certainly there is the feeling that, that I'm getting from we're talking to everything from our neighbour who is a, a real estate agent uh, through to people I know in the retail, is that people are spending money more. Mm. Not at pre-GFC rates, not at pre-2008 rates, but they are spending more money than they have in the last couple of years. Mm. And so it could very well be that the retail sector and the retail association is looking to maybe gain back mm. a little bit of what has been lost mm. in previous years. Um, but the, the one thing that's clear is they're serious about getting us to part with our money. Yeah, yeah, they are very serious. <laughs> and I'm very serious about not parting with it. <laughs> so I want to say a bit about that. If people do have financial goals, and, and look, they might be really super clear and written down, and they, they might be looser and, and less specific, but how can we keep to our money goals during frantic sale time? And it's that feeling of frantic, frantic, I have to do it, I've got to buy it, I've got to, you know, I've got to do it, I've got to do it now. And I have all these people that I need to buy for, I have all of these events that I need to be going to. I think now is the time to sit down and start planning those weeks out. It's, it is only 12 weeks away, I think, maybe it's 11. Um, and just plan out what the occasions are that are going to be happening. You know, I know in the middle of this period, there's um, in Australia, we have uh, Melbourne Cup, mm. which for a lot of people is an $85 ticket to a social event, plus wine, plus a taxi fare, probably a new dress, mm. probably... New shoes, new taxi, <laughs> new bag, new <laughs> lipstick, <laughs> maybe a full makeup new Yeah, yeah. Mm. and you know, that. so have a look at what's happening over those next few weeks and be realistic. I mean, if, you know, if um, the Melbourne Cup is something that you are going to, that's great, but maybe you have to pull back a bit on what your Christmas budget and Christmas money plan is. Start now having uh, agreements with your family about what you're doing with your money at Christmas. I know for me, we have um, my husband has uh, brothers and sisters make up a family of four and 15 nieces and nephews. And, um, you know, we were just talking about it on the weekend so that we all, for the people that want to go to the sales and buy in the sales, they can, but we're all very clear about what the budget is and who we're buying. And you know, for something that big, we're actually doing a secret Santa because for us, it's all about the kids. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to be giving each other things as adults. <laughs> We've got enough stuff, like you said. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the other thing you need to consider in there is not just the gifts. Uh, what I do now is when I do my grocery shopping, I actually add a little bit of stuff in there that I'm going to be so that the week before Christmas, I'm not doing a $500 grocery shop. I've actually spread that out over that period of time. Non-perishable. Non -perishable. <laughs> <laughs> what I like about what you first said there about the planning your events between now and Christmas, I really like that because I think some of us can delude ourselves into, we don't know what's coming up and we have this sort of element of naive surprise when a big event comes up that potentially it's going to cost between $100 and $300 for a single event mm. and we can easily overcome that so easily because I can guarantee you that every year Christmas can fall on the 25th of December <laughs> <laughs> and there is no Good excuse. <laughs> there is no excuse. You can't sit there, uh, you know, a month out and go, oh my gosh, I'm not ready, I'm having plans. Yeah, there's plenty of time. We, we are being bombarded with the next week. We do know that it's around the corner. So now's the time to start putting pen to paper and just getting organised and a bit rational about it. Because I think putting it on pen to paper and seeing it there in front of you, 
actually takes that anxiety away as yeah. well. Yeah, it does. And what about the idea of, of having a discussion with your family or those you're going to spend Christmas with about what this day really means? Uh, I know I, I spend Christmas with my husband and my parents normally and, and some of my brother and brothers and their children, you know, but almost always with my parents. We had a conversation a couple of years ago to say, let's not hide gifts anymore. Let's just make it about having a lovely day together, which we do frequently anyway. Mm -hmm. So making it a bit special it is more challenging without presents. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a really important conversation to say, we feel like we're injecting us in a false sense of, you know, holiday feeling or, or connection by introducing gifts that nobody needs. No, nobody needs them. And I think, I, I don't know about you, but at my um, husband's family aren't close by. So we actually aren't involved in their lives um, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. We probably only really connect with them physically and see what they've got, yeah. you know, every four or five months. Yeah. And so for me to go out and purchase something for them, I don't know if they've already got it, I don't know if they're interested in it. I haven't had those conversations with them. And I don't want to go and spend fifty dollars on something that they're going to, I don't know, for a gift. Lovely. Lovely. Thanks. Yeah. Really wanted that gift of us. <laughs> so talk to us about some of the smart money strategies that people can use that that mean they, they do take advantage of sale time. Mm -hmm. and, and there are legitimate sales, that is mm -hmm. true. Yes. Um, and how can we take advantage of those whilst keeping our daily and keeping our budgets? What are some of those smart money strategies? So making the lists. I think when you're going into um, a department store that's prepared to put you into a hypnotic state, <laughs> you need to be very clear and very focused about what it is you're in for. And have um, have that list and have that budget. Uh, we're talking about gift buying in particular. Um, and use cash. Because I know from my own experience and from the people that I've worked with, if my budget for gift buying per is $50 per person, and there is a um, lovely, I don't know, bar, smelly, creamy, scented thing, and it's 59. If I use my card, my brain says, I'm still in the 50 yeah. mark that you were talking about, Michelle. Only $9. You'll make that up next week. Or do $9 off the next person, which I never do because then I always feel cheap. Yeah. So if, I, but if I've only got $50 cash, I actually walk straight past that one. Yeah. Because it doesn't register to me. I've only got the fifty dollar note. That is so interesting about how that affects your brain, and I'm sure the brains of, of other shoppers. When you know there is an absolute, it's not flexible, yes. negotiable no. limit. No. It's an actual hard limit. Yeah, and this is all I have. Yeah, uh, and you know, I'm talking about credit and debit cards there because it's very easy to overspend on your debit card as well. I think that you can't. See it, touch it, feel it, smell it. Yeah. If you're just not connected to it yeah. as you are to the actual physical piece of money. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, magic I think that in so interesting research about that and, and how much more we spend or we spend, which is the research does vary, but it can be up to 50% more on that wow. that we can spend. Mm -hmm. um, and that applies whether it's debit or credit. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the year on the 31st of December, I'm ready to go to your New Year's Eve party, thinking about all your New Year's resolutions and saying again, this year, yeah. I'm going to stick to my budget. Yeah. You know, it's now's the time to start being conscious. And if you need to make up for lost time because you've overspent and you've had fantastic holidays and you've done whatever you needed to do, you need to finish off the year with grace and with your vision in place and stick to what you said you were going to do. Yeah. Because right at the beginning of the year when you created that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a view that um, so much of our success comes down to how we manage ourselves um, on a daily basis because life is happening at most on a daily basis, it's actually happening in second by second and minute by minute, but it's not happening, we're not getting a week at a time. So how much does daily money habits come into the success of somebody who is managing their money well and is feeling healthy? Yeah. So how important is their daily? Yeah, I think your daily connection to it. If you, if you are looking at it daily, and say you do overspend today, 
you have that opportunity tomorrow to make up for that. So you've given yourself 24 hours. Yes, you've overspent or you've um, made a mistake, or whatever it is. You've got 20. You can make it up that next 24 hours. If you're only managing it weekly, you can get to that end of the week. You've got to make up a week's worth of that. Yeah. If you get to the end of the month, you have to make up a month's worth. Yeah, which can seem overwhelming, I would imagine. It does, and a lot of people put their head in the sand, yeah. and they don't. And that, like I said at the beginning, they look at the credit card statement. They go, "Gee whiz, I must have spent that." Credit card statement says, "Yes, I have the receipt." Oh dear. Yeah. And then go back into it again. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So some of us are already starting to think about Christmas and preparing for Christmas, and um, how can we be money smart? In preparing for the holiday season on December 25, you, that was the breaking news. Christmas <laughs> is December 25 this year, so we know we know that it is. It's official. <laughs> so what can we do to be prepared money wise? So to be prepared money wise now is to sit down and do your budget, assess what your income is going to be over the next couple of months. And also what bills are going to come in in that period of time yeah. as well. Because the other thing to remember is that whatever you're spending in December isn't going to hit you until January. And you have to be prepared to be picking up those kinds. And I'm talking, it's not just credit card bills. Everything comes in in January. The electricity, the school fees, back to school. Yeah. You know, it's it's a lot to think about. So if you can start bringing it back and, you know, having it in an elephant, nice little small bites and have a plan in place. I think that's, yeah. Needs to do. Yeah. Mm. yeah, absolutely. Now we've got some questions on the um, the question machine. On the question machine. <laughs> oh, you mentioned something about Apple before. Yeah. Now that I'm attached to my Apple, <laughs> it's a yeah, part of now, me. now that you actually are holding it in your head. We were talking earlier about how clothing shopping um, has a, a particular set of buying behaviours uh, and habits around it because clothing is so attached to our identity and we have certain feelings about clothing. And the fact that they represent us. And um, most other products we don't have that close of a relationship with. And in fact, the, the idea that we can have a relationship with a brand is a very new idea. Certainly my grandmother never had a relationship with a brand in her entire life and the whole concept would have been farcical to her. Um, but I was saying to Michelle earlier that Apple have done an astounding job of bringing our relationship to the devices that they produce um, into our psyche. So we feel connected to those devices. We feel they say something about us, that they represent us in a way that really no device should have the power to do so. Um, but Apple have done that, and they've done that through, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant and well-considered um, campaigns mm. on multiple levels with their multiple products. And their marketing messages are all about the emotion. They're all about evoking a sense of emotion. It's not about use or practicality no. or, or really what this device will even do for you. So you don't even know its functionality from the marketing messages. And I'm thinking particularly of television advertising. Mm -hmm. But it's the feeling that they create. And they have done that brilliantly. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, let me check my attachments. Prove <laughs> <laughs> the point in real time. One of the um, questions or comments is how do you combat children's expectations on the gifts that they get? These days, parents seem to want to outdo each other, so kids grow up wanting things because the parents want them to look like they provide. Mm. Have you come across that from you know, what you do with your work? Not so much with children, although um, I have had women join our program who want to excuse their buying behaviour, and I do say that with a great amount of respect and love, um, because they're buying for others. Um, they're buying for grandchildren or mm. for children. Um, so they, they're still buying too much. It's beyond their means and they are financially uncomfortable um, and they are emotionally and psychologically often in great amounts of pain. But it seems okay because it's buying for connection. It's buying mm. for contribution. So it's for somebody else. But I do meet parents who, when I talk a little bit about what I do, will throw their hands up and say, I don't want my child to grow up thinking that every time I go shopping, there's something for them 
or that the only way that they can feel good is when they receive something. I don't want them to have that emotional connection to material goods that is so strong um, that they cannot be um, satiated emotionally through something as mundane as um, running outside mm. or swimming in the pool or riding their bike, which may not be new. Yeah. Uh, and, and I really feel for parents who are, are trying to have to disconnect that sense of joy comes in a box. Mm. I think I've been um, pretty practical about that. And I don't know if that's to do with my upbringing or you know the world that I live in. I don't know. But I know from my children, we have, um, I don't buy anything for them over $100. And I don't think I've actually bought anything over $50. And that's because if they really want it, uh, so my 10 year old has just saved up and bought her own mini iPad. I didn't even put in the first 100. Yeah. Said that I would, but she didn't want it. She'd saved it. She has the connection to the value of it. Yeah. So she's looking after that mini iPad. So much better than if I had bought it for her. If, if I had bought it for her, it would have meant six months of hard labour at our house, <laughs> earning the pocket money to buy a mini iPad. Yeah. So she's not only is she learning how to save, she's actually learning work ethic yeah. as well. And that I think something that's missing in society is, especially with children, I know a lot of children that are getting paid an allowance. Mm. That doesn't work. Yeah. They need to be, because that's not life. Yeah. Nobody's paying me an allowance, yeah. are they? I wish they were, but I don't think they are. I have to work for my money. Yeah. And we need to be creating that work ethic within yeah. our children. We are their teacher. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that the way that money comes is, is through a set of behaviours and then what you do with that money has consequences as yes. well. And this is pretty much how life happens yes. um, when you're all grown up. And, yeah. and when you start learning those messages, I, I think of not having children. I'm in a really luxurious position of being expert on how to raise them. <laughs> um, great, give me some <laughs> But I, I, I think of manners as well. And yeah. I, I was talking to my beautician about this who has three young children, and, and she's adamant that they will learn manners. And she was saying, when when you start, and she thinks that it starts as early as, as possible. Oh, yes. And, and money's got to be the same. Yes. Money is an inescapable fact of life. Mm. Um, and, you know, and, unless you, you know, become Grizzly Adams and, and go and, you know, live, live in the forest and forage mm -hmm. the berries, then money is going to be a part of your life. And having some early consciousness around it, appropriate for the child's mm. age mm -hmm. and development, I think you're doing your child an enormous service mm. by introducing them to um, your various elements of money management and earning money, saving money, and, and possibly the most important, investing money. Yes, yes. And spending money. Yeah. I mean, spending is part of the cycle. Yeah. Teaching them how to spend it wisely and getting value for money is really important. Um, both of my, uh, so my 10 year old and my 8 year old have journals with little dividers in them and every time they spend their money they have to bring back the receipt and write down how much money they spent. And you know my categories in my household are entertainment and groceries and they've got lollies <laughs> <laughs> things from the supermarket. And, but they can see yeah. what they're spending their lollies on, yeah. what they're spending their money on. And I said to Kate, she's eight, are you really satisfied that you spent that 20 bucks on lollies. We added it all up. It was $20 on lollies. You could have got this for $20. Yes. And you know, the lolly eating has gone right down. And the savings are going up. <laughs> that is really interesting because that comes up a lot in our program, um, my youth at clothes shopping, which is a year long program that helps connect women more to what they already have, mm -hmm. not just in their wardrobes, but in their lives, is this whole idea of what else could I spend my money on. Mm. And we have a lot of women who have flashes of insight to say, if I hadn't bought all of those shoes, if I hadn't bought all of those clothes, what else could I buy? And they start to transform that into a present time to say, um, I had the option of buying the sculpted stainless steel necklace for $250, but I opted instead to have a day spa experience. Um, and you know, you, you can start to expand as you think about what else you could spend your money on. And at one point, um, for a media appearance, I was asked to add up how much I think I'd spent on my wardrobe, and it was well over 
thousand dollars on clothing. And you know, fortunately, I never got myself in a huge financial hole, but on credit when it came to my clothesline. But oh my dear, what I could have bought mm -hmm. if I hadn't have been buying those hundred and fifty pairs shoes. Wow. Wow, it's amazing. And even when they are, uh, like for my people that are tracking their spending for 28 days in the challenge, they're astounded on just, you know, the $50 that they spent on coffee. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's about that, but it's about what you stand for and what I stand for is this conscious yeah. connection yeah. with our money. Yeah. Is this dollar that I'm spending serving me? Is it of value? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's not about being anti-shopping, which I, I am not. Um, Shopping needs to be put in its rightful place in our lives and, and it, it shouldn't be at the top of the list in your life. Mm. One of the other questions is um, what's a reasonable amount to spend on children at the various age levels? <laughs> well, I, I guess one of the questions would be on what? What items are you talking about? And how much money do you earn? Yeah, yeah, in, exactly. Um, and, and you know, so I'll be talking about essentials, mm. night um, clothing, mm -hmm. um, because even that area, I mean, there's a huge variety in, in children's clothing mm. um, in terms of, of pricing and availability. And, and I, I spoke recently, I was the guest speaker at a children's clothes spot, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Because that's, that's a great standard. idea. Children grow, right? They yeah. grow. They, so they, they, they change all the time. Stop. They don't stop. And, and you know, one of the things, depending on the item of clothing and how much they're used, is, is that those clothes can be in relatively good to great condition. Mm. They're hardly worn because the child has outgrown them. And so the whole idea of, of recycling and making good quality clothing um, available to, to people at, at a discounted price, I think it's an excellent. One. I, I can't understand why there's a fortune in this That's a great idea. Was that here on the coast? It was in Brisbane. In Brisbane, yeah. Oh. Clothes swap. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And so did they just, did you, did you have to pay a fee or you just go yeah, in? It was $25. And, it was a beautiful high tea. It was one of the nicest high teas I've ever been to. It was $25 just for the food. Then you got me as the guest speaker. Um, and then the, then the clothes swap. And it was just organised by size. So it's just really lovely. Like, that is cool. Do they have any kind of um, any kind of guidelines on it? Because I mean, some people spend ridiculous amounts on yeah. You know, I've seen hundred dollar leather jackets for two year olds. Yeah, which, which just wouldn't I don't know be a fair swap with the four dollar Kmart one. <laughs> and for this children's swap, they didn't have those kinds of guidelines. Mm -hmm. There are um, women's swaps uh, around the country. The clothing exchange run uh, a monthly event in uh, Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. And they have particular guidelines. Mainly it's around the quality of the garment in terms of its condition. So mm. it's not so much about the label. Mm. Um, so, so you bring six, you take six away, that, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but this one didn't have that. But they're just in general guidelines that mm. the quality should be of a reasonable quality in those. I think when it comes to spending money on your children, we don't have, um, other than the $100 rule, there's no uh, set amount of money for our three children. It's like we don't say, well, well, we won't spend over a certain amount of money, but we won't spend up to it either. Mm -hmm. If there's something that they need, we will buy that for them as a Christmas gift. Um, and we do we do, do the want things as well. We don't give them everything they want either. Shall you use the children to understand what it means to say $100 versus $10? Or is there a level that children really start to understand that? I think that I've just done an experiment with Sophie, and I can't remember if I talked about it in the last um, video that we did, where I did the um, thirty-dollar experiment. Yeah, uh, she she understands it because she's in that realm now where she can see what you get for thirty dollars, and that you can get a mini iPad for three hundred and whatever it is. Yeah. Kate's eight, and she hasn't quite got that yet. I could um, I could send her in and she'd buy thirty dollars worth of wallets. Yeah. Whereas Sophie's a bit more strategic about getting the value of that money. So it's definitely an age thing. But then that could also be, as I'm kind of thinking on the spot here, I've probably invested more money education into Sophie because she's the oldest yeah. than I have with Kate yet. I'll make it up to you, Kate, don't worry about it. <laughs> you, know, you know, I think about my nephews and, and my aunts and nephews are 12 and, and we've had quite a bit of time with them. 
and his concept of ten dollars would would be very similar to his concept of a hundred. Yes, mm. he understands a hundred is more, but the that that actual what does it translate into? Um, I don't think he had a really clear notion mm. of what that was. Yeah, you know, one plastic dinosaur, ten plastic dinosaurs. Yes, and you know, just quantity as opposed to actual quality. Yeah. And that's the important thing too at Christmas time in some of anyone kids to this day. Um, it's not about the amount of stuff. You know, they um, my children get inundated with gifts from you know, from their granddad, from their, from their relatives, which is beautiful because everybody loves to give. Um, but again, we were talking about this before we started, it's what is Christmas really about? Yeah. What's the meaning of it? Yes, for me, Christmas is about reliving it now through the eyes of my children and their excitement and the little secret that everybody knows about them. Um, versus how that was if we were on our own. And it's different for you too. You need to come to some kind of agreement about what the experience and what what is the magic of Christmas. What does that mean to you? The magic of Christmas is not the most present thing. Yeah. And, and, and I don't... I'm just going to guess that this is true, but I'm guessing that you would sooner have the presence of that grandparent regularly in the lives of your yes. children as opposed to a five hundred dollar present under the tree and nothing throughout the year or very little meaningful content mm. throughout the year. Mm. Yes, definitely. And we have another question coming in and I'm just showing <laughs> right studio live, just one moment. <laughs> um Another organisation called Kneebox. Kneebox, what's clothes and toys in Brisbane? It's $12 each. And thanks, Nicola. There you go. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Just demonstrating you again the range of options that are there for um, being sustainable in your choices, being conscious in your choices. Because buying new is not the only option that we have. No. And, and you're one of, one of the services that I know a lot of libraries provide is a toy library. Um, because I understand sometimes children get bored with toys. Mm. And presuming that all the safety issues are covered with the toys that have been previously overplayed by another child, I think it's a pretty nice idea. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. We also used to have three boxes that we rotated. So we would have within within our house, we'd bring out one box and then once they were getting bored, we'd put that one away and bring out the other one. And then a few boxes would come back. Yeah. They thought it was new, you know, they had it before. And that's one of the things that when you do my course, we talk about with the clothing, is rotating them through there. So there's a mm. sense of newness yes. in, in what's there in your wardrobe, particularly if you have wardrobe. Um, yeah, and that would be also with the accessorising? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 So, so making it too fresh. Yeah. <laughs> um, some other questions that I had to come in there was, this one was, well, practical gifts versus want gifts. Why are the most sought after gifts? <laughs> are we talking Tiffany? That that kind of price? Wow, oh, that kind of price tag. Gee whiz, just for that blue box. Yeah. Mm. Um, the words "you're worth it" were coined by a copywriter in the 1950s. Um, she was writing for L'Oreal, and she wrote those words in regards to your lipstick. And those uh, three words, I think, are responsible for more ridiculous notions <laughs> of self-worth connected to physical material items. Mm. And, and, and as clever as a piece of copywriting that is, I that I think those three words have done a lot of damage to our contemporaries. Yes. Where we feel worth comes from, where we feel acknowledgement comes mm. from. And I remember seeing a Facebook post, somebody um, had a birthday and a very expensive bit of real jewellery as opposed to costume jewellery. And uh, the words under it was unworth it. And it actually made me feel a little bit sad mm. to think. Uh, and I'm not saying beautiful things, we shouldn't have beautiful things. There, there are artists out there who create beautiful things that you know, are, are worthy of admiration. And certainly if, if your financial circumstances allow it and, and it, it feels like the right kind of purchasing decision for you, then then you know you, you make the choices that are right for you. Mm. But to connect it to a sense of self worth, that's where I have an objection mm. um, to saying I am worth this or I am worth this or, or, or I'm worth anything mm. of a material nature. That is an unfillable hole. 
you will never feel truly worthy if that's where your sense of worth is coming from and the source of it is being fed from. There are not enough stone and bracelets in the world to make you truly. Mm. And so it really needs to come from you. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it certainly does. Now, um, are there any final tips that you'd like to put forward to? I want to summarise what we've talked about. Um, getting clear on what your expenses are, not only the gift giving and the, the food and, and whatever events you're hosting, but the events that you're attending. I think that's just was, was fantastic. Just, just to map it out mm -hmm. on a calendar mm -hmm. and put a little on the month of the festival. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps think of ways that you can attend those events where you don't have to buy your dress or a new pair of shoes. Or what else can you either do without a bit creative about sourcing that means that that, that price tag is a little bit lower? Just maybe giving you more choices. More yeah, can, can you carpool to an event or share a taxi to, event, to an event rather than paying the whole taxi yeah. pay yourself? Or maybe you might host a Melbourne Cup event in your own home and, and, and have it be sort of a, a, a gum boots and ball bounds sort of event where everyone wears phones. And everybody so, brings a plate. Yeah. And a bottle of bubble. I mean, and drop in. So thinking creatively about those kinds of things and, and having some clarity around these things should not jump up out of the calendar and hit us on the forehead. We should be able to see them coming. Mm. And, and I think that's a great idea. And, and the whole thing, where we need having them in stick to the list. Stick to the list. Just stick to the list. Stick to the list. Because what you're going to get bombarded with from the twenty fifth of December, or well, the shops won't be open, but the twenty fourth of December is the next lot of sales. Yeah. And yeah. that's going to start all over again. Yeah. And the insanity of boxing day sales though. I one of my last key missions to never go to a boxing day sale. Oh really? Oh come on, let's go with hard hat. <laughs> Just so we can say, you there. Do you have a, a closing question for people to ponder? I do. I would like to see what kind of creative ideas people can come up with for gift giving. So maybe let's think of um, some creative gifts that we could make uh, for adults or for people at work. You know, that's a popular thing too, is giving people at work. Maybe even kids. What's something that the kids can be involved in? Um, in preparing for Christmas. I know my um, kids have just been to a relative's house where they've already started making Christmas stockings, which they're going to be giving to gifts for people. Um, and you know, that, that's all handmade and that's beautiful that they've taken that time to do that. They haven't rushed off to the $2 shop and bought one off the rack. It's a part of them that they've put <laughs> blood, sweat and tears into it. Yeah. It's, um, it's the thought that counts. One of the nicest Christmas gifts I ever received was it was a metal barrel, kind of like a bin, but it had been hand painted by my aunt, and it was it, you know she had some creative skill, <laughs> and so it was a, a beautiful um, motif, floral motif. It was really gorgeous, but I thought that it was such a simple idea, mm. but so much personal thought had gone yes. into it. Yeah, it had things in it. It wasn't just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be a bit of an odd gift. Um, but how much thought was put into the packaging? And, yeah. and you know, even little things like um, you know, packaging things in fabric or tea towels mm. or something that can be reused. Yes, yes. And another good wrapping paper one that I uh, that I have used and that we'll be doing shortly is butcher's paper with the kids' handprints. And you can you know you can do pretty handprints that look like reindeer ears and Jump on Pinterest. They've got fabulous things to do on there. Everybody can be an artist if you ever look on print. Yeah, yeah. Pinterest. Yeah. So yeah, if you could um, jump on the page and put some comments there about what you're going to do to be on top of your money this Christmas. Let us know if you're going to knuckle down this weekend and put a plan in place. And uh, if you've got any other tips um, or tricks that we need to know about. Have you got another message? No, I there? don't. But um, I want to let people know that we are going to be having another hangout. Ah, yes. And I was just checking the date because it's uh, we've been making them the first Tuesday of the month. But the first Tuesday of November is Melbourne Cup Day. Yes. Not, I, I wouldn't be expecting a big turnout on the evening of Melbourne Cup. <laughs> so we're making it the following night, which is Wednesday, the 6th of November, Australian Eastern Standard. Oh, and everybody could share 
what wonderful saving tip they have from uh, from that event, the Australian event. Yeah. Also, we'll be coming into Thanksgiving too for our friends over in America. Yeah. So that's another big spending time for those guys too, with you know the decorations and the food yeah. that's going on. So you just be a bit conscious about what it is you're doing with your dollar and uh, live money smart. Thank you. Thank you.